Good morning, or good evening in Australia, mm -hmm. good morning in London and the mm -hmm. United Kingdom, and welcome to the latest edition of the uh, Morning Learnings. Um, I'm delighted to be joined by Samantha McLean from Elite Agent, uh, Elite Agent, editor of Elite Agent magazine, um, has a superb podcast called Elevate Podcast, interviews the best guests in Australia, um, and around the world, actually. I think you've had some Americans on there that I've listened to um, as well. Um, so absolutely exceptional. So thank you so much for joining me. I know it's a really, really busy time for you because you're putting on a transform program where you have a 30-day program with 22 world-class speakers. So that sounds very exciting. What's that about? And do you prefer to be called Sam or Samantha? Uh, I answered it pretty much everything, so uh, <laughs> <laughs> so that's all good. Thank you very much for having me, and um, you know, and hello, and hello, UK. I've got family over in the UK at the moment, so um, you know, not that he'll be listening because he's not a real estate agent, but um, but but great to be here. Um, yeah, Transform is a thirty-day challenge for real estate agents um, to really better their careers. So what we do is we pull together some of the best coaches and trainers. And we've been running this as a virtual event even before the pandemic. So they get two webinars a week and some tried and true principles to help them get more productive and more clear on their goals. And we see some very big changes in 30 days. It's quite amazing. We've been doing it now for about five years. Wow. So what's the biggest transformation, the biggest win that um, one of the agents taken part has um, had from it? Yeah, um, a lot of the time it's clarity, like some people are working in a business and then they decide to take over a business, they decide that they really want to own it. Um, that's probably one of the biggest changes we see. Sometimes we sort of see people that, you know, they're in property management or something other than they discover that they really want to be in sales. Um, a lot of the time it's just productivity. So, you know, like when you start clearing away the clutter and things like that from a productivity perspective, it's amazing what sort of a result that you can get. And you see some agents just um, their performance like literally goes through the roof. Because I think the thing is, after 30 days, you can really pick up some good habits and, um, and you know, embed them into your general routine. And, you know, 30 days is a, is a great length of time to make a change. So, yeah. Fantastic. So how did you get into running an exceptional magazine, the Elite Agent magazine, and then starting the podcast? What's your story, please? Well, uh, it started probably about 10 years ago now. I actually started writing for a real estate magazine because I was working for a company that sold into the real estate industry. And, um, you know, the, at that time, the internet was pretty interesting and a great way of building authority. So I started writing for this magazine and I started writing articles and things like that and kind of became well known and well networked um, but at the time the magazine the magazine that I was sort of working for um, was really just a print magazine didn't have much of a digital presence and it didn't last that big sort of boom in in the internet I, I believe in the internet <laughs> I believe it's here to stay <laughs> um, and, you know, it was, it was a bit of a sad time for me, actually, because I really enjoyed the work that I was doing in the real estate industry and really enjoyed interviewing real estate agents and all of that sort of thing. And everyone just sort of said to me, well, you know, why don't you just do it yourself? But doing it myself wasn't an easy proposition at the time because I was a single mother and had no money. And, you know, you've got to think twice about going into a business which you've just seen, you know, go by the wayside. And so, like, I really had to think about, what I wanted to do and how I wanted to do it um, and it took me a year or so and I was working for another company at the time or other companies so Elite Agent was actually my side hustle um, until I could convince my now husband to come and help me sell advertising and things like that and the rest as they say is history. So actually that's interesting because there's people here are going to be starting new agencies and new businesses um, despite what's going on. So what advice can you give them when you're starting a new business? What did you take away from um, literally having to set it all up? Um, and I've got to tell you a funny story about the internet in a minute. You just reminded me. Um, I would say um, somebody very wise, one of my heroes in life, Ida Buttrose, she, I watched her speaking just as I was a starting elite agent and she quoted Og Ogmandino um, and one of his famous quotes is, you don't have to see the whole staircase to take the first step. 
and so the thing is is like i i didn't really focus on the end goal which was having a magazine i just focused on taking steps and i think if you want to own an agency or get into business ownership like take the first step and then take the next step and then take the next step and all of a sudden like if you keep taking steps and keep showing up consistently you know you might find yourself very surprised where you end up now that's my favorite c word consistently consistently um yeah. so i'm sure with your agents that must be one of the things that you work with is um how do they become consistent in their approach and everything they do I mean, obviously working with, I'm sure, 22 world-class um, coaches, they're giving you advice all the time or giving all your agents all the time. So how do agents be consistent in whether it's um, prospecting, listing, negotiating, selling? Yeah, I think, well, it's tricky, you know, like, and it's it's right when you work with coaches all the time, you seem to get free coaching from them, you know, because they're always, you're interviewing them and they're sort of giving you a lot of lessons in life. And you're right about the consistency. Like a lot of people say um, hustle beats talent when talent won't hustle. Well, I say consistency beats talent when talent isn't consistent. And so um, what I think in terms of getting consistent is pick one method of prospecting, one method that you like and get really good at it. Because if you spread yourself too thin across, you know, let's just say it's phone calls and door knocking and social media, chances are you only really enjoy one out of three. Um, and then if you try and do all three, perhaps you're spreading yourself a bit too thin. So I would master um, and be consistent at one thing and then I'd take, take the step to the next thing and then the next thing. Okay, so my internet story was 22 years ago, my boss sent me to America to the NAR conference and he came back, he said, what's the one thing you learned? So I said, they're talking about something called WWW, World Wide Web. <laughs> I tell you what, you don't need to worry about it. We don't think it's gonna be that big. And I think I got that, I think I got that slightly wrong. And I remember it because literally um, we took our six month um, son along um, to Orlando to it and so he wasn't very well so I remember it for all the wrong reasons and getting www very wrong so yeah yeah so, so it's amazing how far it's come yeah it is and actually you think it's a lot longer um you know and it's only well you know 22 years ago they were talking about it um so yeah it's incredible so in lockdown um i understand you moved office or bought an office and you've also bought an investment property as well so what was that like as an experience as a as an end user actually yeah it's been very very interesting to be the end user rather than the interviewer um and like we went in lockdown so um my husband and i based in new south wales and and basically i think new south wales has tried its best to manage um, the pandemic, but because we were taking a lot of, and I say we, um, it felt like we were taking in a lot of the hotel quarantine and things like that. So obviously, you know, stuff happens and not a lot of the other Australian states were opening their borders to New South Wales. At the beginning of the pandemic in 2020, we had planned to move to Queensland, which is where I am now, actually. This is probably the first thing that we've done or the second thing that we've done in this brand new studio. Um, but yeah, we'd planned to move up here at the beginning of last year. And then of course, lockdown happened. And then, you know, it was like, you're from Sydney. No, you're not going anywhere. And then we got this bit of a sniff of, um, okay, it looks like the borders might be opening around about Christmas. We look like we've got this virus under control. And so we took that opportunity to go, all right, well, let's sell our office in Sydney and let's buy something in Queensland and start making moves um, to get up there. The only thing is, is because we're in New South Wales, we couldn't actually view anything in person in Queensland. And yeah, there were three transactions. So one is we we rented a house, one is we bought an office, and the other is we bought an investment property, um, all sight unseen during that time. And then and then to add uh, complication to the whole thing, then you know, well, while it looked like the borders were uh, opening, opening, opening um around christmas time there was another outbreak in the northern beaches and everyone went no sorry new south wales people you can't come in so we made a bit of a race to the border just before christmas it was very exciting <laughs> not in a good way <laughs> I, can, I can imagine i can imagine so sight unseen what was that experience what was that experience like and well 
Yeah, it's it's in, you just do the best you can. And with some agents, it's a great experience because they're all kitted up with the virtual tours and things like that, and you, and you can virtually feel like you're there. In other cases, this is where a floor plan, I think, is critical, um, you know, so that you can actually measure up and sort of work out what's going to go where, particularly when you're making a, a long-distance move interstate because you don't want to sort of go through the... Um, you know, the, the, experience, the experience or the expense of carting things via removalists that you don't need to. Like sometimes you can be overcapitalizing on the stuff that you put on the removal truck. It would be cheaper to buy it somewhere else. Um, so actually just looking at photos and trying to piece together a floor plan and things like that, I'm very lucky that my husband is quite savvy with those sorts of measurements. I'm not. I'm the creative one in the family. <laughs> um, but it, it was it was weird. We we got here on the 21st of December and sort of went into um, into isolation or into quarantine as per the rules, um, Queensland's rules, um, which was home quarantine. So we got up here and we thought, well, at least the house we've rented looks pretty good. I think we've we've big tick there. And then we sat there for two weeks wondering what the office really looked like. <laughs> so. Oh. Um, you know, pretty interesting. And and the, the other property's got a tenant in it, but the agent was great and used FaceTime and gave us walk-arounds and was very, very patient with us. So um, I think where there's a will, there's a way. And definitely, you know, in our situation, I don't think lockdown is a barrier to actually transacting real estate. And that's what we're seeing in Sydney, at, 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 sorry, in Australia at the moment, is that, you know, people want to move. And you know, and, and they want to move more and more and more. And we're seeing more and more and more of that even in, in this month. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. Um, on rentals or leases there, does every agent have a floor plan or is it just a few? It's it's not 100 percent, which as a as a customer is pretty annoying, especially when um, when you can't see something. So I think um realestate.com.au have said for a long time that, you know, the one thing that people really want to see on, on a listing, whether it's sales or whether it's a rental, uh, is a floor plan. And I think, you know, if you can provide a floor plan with your listing, then um, consumers will love it. Brilliant. Thank you. So you have interviewed exceptional <laughs> agents in Australia, exceptional trainers around the world. Um, what have you learned from interviewing the best of the best um, from a performance perspective or uh, or about them, are we Both. gossiping? <laughs> yeah, let's, let's gossip. Let's gossip. Okay, who, should um, we, who, should, who do you want to start with? No. Um, uh, you know, from what, you know, what does it take to be a top, a top performer in Australia? Yeah, I think if, if I could, you know, go back to the theme on consistency, um, what I think the top agents are good at is not necessarily one thing. It's that they're consistent across a broad range of things. And so, like, I often refer to it because my background is corporate. I refer to it as a chain link system, like sales is a chain link system in that let's just say, um, you know, someone thinks social media is going to be the answer to my prospecting problems. Social media won't be the answer to your prospecting problems unless everything else is in order. And so I think that, you know, like if, if I was an agent looking at this or listening to this, I'd be thinking, okay, what's my prospecting like? What's my listing presentation like? Um, what am I like at negotiating? What is my post-sale service like? And then picking that one area that is a bit weaker than all the others because you can only ever, ever be as good, rather, as your weakest link. So that will always hold you back. And the thing about the really top agents or the really good agents is that they're broadly, they're like 1% better in each area. It's not like they're um, amazingly better at, at one thing because, you know, let's face it, if your head's in, on fire and your feet are in a bucket of ice, it doesn't even out to a comfortable body temperature. <laughs> Um, so, you know, you're much better to be consistent across a whole range of things and get the basics right and then build on those basics. Okay, so you touched on my favourite subject, or one of my favourite subjects, post-sale service. So in the UK, 95% of agents have no stay-in-touch policy. So um, you buy through me and then you end up in witness protection. You won't ever hear from <laughs> me for however many years. So the best of the best, what has the you know what's what have you come across is there stay in touch policy that you think wow that works really well 
Yeah, the best of the best to have actually an automated stay in touch policy at the end of it. So as soon as you um, settle on the house, uh, you might get, a, I know an agent, Will Ainsworth, um, like she's not an agent anymore. He works for Open Negotiation, but um, as soon as as soon as he would close on a house, he would give the people in the house a gift voucher for you know somebody local in the area, like somebody who mows lawns, um, or you know somebody who cleans windows or something like that, which is a bit of a win win in both ways because the local business owner gets um, you know gets business and the homeowner gets something that you know that they didn't know that they were going to get. And I can remember talking to Will. Um, you know, I can send you the episode link. I think he actually had a whole process for after sales service. So it was, you know, on day one you'd get a voucher, on day two you'd get something else. On day on day twenty you would get, you know, like a hey, how's your new home going? There would just be something in place um, that he almost didn't even have to think about, which would just happen. Um, but you're right. Like over the years, you know, I was talking to my husband about this the other day is you know he might have um been in the in the middle of buying or selling six houses and nobody ever got back to him after the transaction so but then you know uh if if i could give you another example i interviewed a lady for the latest edition of the magazine from queensland and uh, she's just known as the postcard lady <laughs> um and basically what she does is anyone who she transacts a property with and it's just simple it's just like a postcard that she'll send them every year and it is funny she's known as the card lady and so after getting a card for years and years and years and it's a really inexpensive thing to do um you know i had a friend that said oh look we called in three agents but i had to go with this lady who's been sending me cards all the time because she's just taking the time to keep in touch with me um, and something as simple like you know that doesn't take artificial intelligence or fancy prop tech or anything like that I think particularly more and more you know like especially after what we've been through with the pandemic and are still going through in some places that people actually want to feel safe with another human and you know I think the people that put the human touch into their marketing are the people that you know are going to find it really paying off thank you um, so on the marketing theme, what else do you see that, um, again, has been working really well from these top performers? Yeah, the top performers, I guess, you know, that again, they do the basics well. Um, they Something that we did notice last year that the top performers were doing really well is, um, you know, taking back the narrative because, you know, um, and I exclude ourselves from, from this definition of the mainstream media, if you like, but the mainstream media love a good headline and consumers listen to those headlines, you know, sales values have gone down, you know, 30% in this area. And then all of a sudden, you know, the agent or 30% across the nation and then the agent in this area where, because Australia is made up a lot of a lot of different markets, uh, the agent over in this area, values are actually going up and yet, you know, buyers are lowballing because they've just heard this, um, you know, this media headline, which makes no sense for that particular area. And I'm sure that you get a lot of that over in the UK as well. And so last year, successful agents weren't necessarily talking about the pandemic all the time, but they were very good at keeping track of their own statistics in their own market so that they could say, well, you know, while people are saying this, what we're seeing on the ground here is this, days on market are this, um, you know, the the values in, you know, values might have gone down nationally by this, but values in our area have gone up like this and sort of acting like community reporters. And, um, you know, and I, I sort of do believe that if every other part of, your shop is in order, um, taking back the narrative and being the, almost the community news and not just reporting on your own stuff, but reporting like being the authority in the market um, is has proven a real winning strategy as well. Yeah, 100%. Well, CNN is constant negative news, so nobody watches that over here. Um, <laughs> But I think you're spot on. You know, I'm seeing agents in the UK doing weekly market wraps, telling people what's going on in their area. The highest price property come on this week was this. The lowest price is this. Um, X amount of properties have sold in your area. Um, X amount of properties have been let in your area. Um, and you're doing it from 
all the agents. So, you know, we've got the portals here, right, move, Zoopla um, on the market, and they're getting that information from that and they're using it. And and what we're finding is because they're there, I mean, you know, I know you've got, you're a massive fan and I think everybody in the UK is of Lisa Novak and everything she's done over here. So she's got a raving, raving UK fan base <laughs> as well. Um, and again, just all those messages that, you know, getting people, telling people what's going on. Um, and that's opening the doors, especially for new agents. You know, Facebook and video is now making it a level playing field um, and yeah. doing all the Facebook lives, um, educating people, doing videos with local um, you know, solicitors, mortgage brokers, accountants, and also helping people in your community that, you know, we're in lockdown at the moment. So we've got agents um, doing videos with um, personal trainers, with people in art classes, um, yoga classes, and just putting them on for their community. So, you know, one, they're serving their community that need them, and also they're helping people in their community, you know, which is, which is great. And they're remembered at the end. So uh, I've yeah. got one agent that consistently did the um, market wraps every month. And then a lady walked into um, his office and said, here are the keys to my property. He said, well, what do you mean? I haven't even seen your property yet. He said, no, I trust you because I've seen you. I know what you're doing. You're doing an amazing job, but you don't know what my fees are. doesn't matter. doesn't matter. I trust you. I want to give you my property. And that's yeah. it. It's building that trust, people getting to know you all the time. And that makes a massive, massive difference. Um, and then you see the people that Lisa and what they're doing. Um, has Lisa been a real disruptor in the industry there? Definitely. Look, I think um, a lot of people here really look up to Lisa because to, to everyone else, Lisa appears fearless, you know, because she's not afraid to get on social media and be authentic and things like that. And I think a lot of agents, um, they, they look at Lisa and it, it's almost like, oh, my gosh, what would people think of me if I did that? But I think that's really thinking about it the wrong way because Lisa's disposition towards social media is that she wants to help people. She's not doing it for the likes or for the personal validation or anything like that. She's genuinely doing it to help people in the market. And I think what really works for Lisa, interestingly enough, is that, you know, some people just think real estate agents charge this enormous commission for doing not much. But I think when, um, you know, when you demonstrate that you're really working your butt off like Lisa is, like constantly, um, you know, I think that gives the consumer an idea of how much work is involved in, in what a real estate agent does. And I think that's why you get that effect of, well, here's the keys to my property. I just want you to do it because they see someone working really hard on everyone's behalf. And, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't be, the commission then doesn't become so much of an issue, I think. Yeah, so Carly's just um, put moving day pack, tea, milk, shortbread, cleaning products work well for mortgage providers to first time buyers. Data shows it takes seven hours of touch points for, for the big brands um, to turn a shopper into a consumer. Thank you, Carly. So, um, so let's name names then. Um, <laughs> Matt, Matt, Stein, Matt Steinway, exceptional. Uh, number one in the McGrath stable of two and a half thousand agents. Again, I'm sure you've had a um, chance to interview Matt. Um, again, you know, what were his top top qualities that you think, wow, you know, I can understand why he's number one in the, in the McGrath group and whether he's one of the top three with Alexander Phillips as well. Well, I think, um, and yeah, we have had Matt in the studio. He didn't, he didn't want to put his headphones on. I was, I think he might have been worried about messing up his hair. Um, but um, is, it, are we dishing? That's what we're dishing. Um, but I think, I think Matt's pretty realistic, actually. Like I remember interviewing him, and you know, I think at the time he was a bit frustrated with people who think that you know that sort of success comes easy or cheap, and. Um, you know, it's quite obvious to me that Matt has had some exceptional mentors and he's worked exceptionally hard throughout his career. And similar to Lisa, like, you know, he sort of works his social media, um, you know, he's got the backing of a good team. And, you know, and I think, it, again, he, he, would, he would even say it's not one particular thing. It's doing a bunch of things over and over and over again um, that lead to the sort of, you know, figures and results that he's getting right now.
So that's and interesting. Has been for years, yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, you've spoken twice about social media with Lisa and uh, with Matt. And I know you've had some really exceptional um, social media people on your um, podcast as well. So have you got two or three tips that people, you know, should be using or that work exceptionally well for these top performers on social? Or again, does it come back to our favourite C word, consistency? Um, no, I think there's there's a couple of things that you can you can um, kind of take away from all of that. I think that the agents that we've talked about, they've chosen one platform and they've really specialised in it. So again, this is rather than spreading yourself too thin, like think about, you know, where your audience is, where are they hanging out? And then how do you get really good at that platform and speaking the language of that platform? Like for some people, like let's say you're an agent that specialises in, and I'm a big fan of having a specialisation, like, you know, especially if you're new in the game, you want to have some sort of a niche. Um, because then it's much easier to get to the top of a niche than it is to get to the top of real estate. So, you know, are you the number one agent for entrepreneurs? Are you the number one agent in duplexes? Like look at Josh, you know, Josh Teslin. I'm sure um, some people in the UK probably follow him. Yes. He sold one duplex and then another duplex and then another duplex and all of a sudden he was the duplex guy and then he leveraged that niche into something else. So I think, you know, definitely having a niche um, I think he also started just focusing purely on Facebook and getting really good at that and then leveraged it into other things. Um, so, for example, like, you know, I'll tell you what I wouldn't do is if I was still trying to get um, good at Facebook or Instagram, I wouldn't be worrying about Clubhouse just yet. Um, I, I went into that the other day and I sort of thought, God, this is a rabbit hole of... <laughs> Like I could never, I may never come out. And then I was just thinking, oh no, this is the latest shiny object where people will flock to and think that it's going to be the great big, you know, um, you know, another shiny object that's going to solve everyone's prospecting problems. And I don't believe that. I think it takes a lot of work and consistency to get, you know, to get really good at at one thing. Similarly, you know, like if if you think, well let me specialise in a type of market, like let's say it's entrepreneurs or business people, like, you know, you might specialise in, you know, LinkedIn might be your thing. Um, but I think the one thing is like, you know, I think everyone's getting sick of agents memeing themselves these days. <laughs> I think we've all, you know, just don't do the quote thing um, and genuinely think, well, look, if I was following you, what would I want to see? What is valuable? What 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 would somebody um, you know, hit that save button on in Facebook. You know how you've got that save button where you can sort of save a link and come back to it later? Is this save worthy? Um, you know, am I offering some education or something like that? Am I offering news about the local area? Um, because, you know, and it doesn't even have to be, you know, like um, detailed or anything like that, but it does have to offer value. And secondly, with um, with all social media, I'd start getting smart about it. Like there's some great tools out there like repurpose.io and things like that where, for example, I see like I see you guys are using StreamYard. So let's say you do a Facebook Live. Um, you can use a tool like repurpose.io to automatically shoot that Facebook Live to YouTube and then you could send it to Dropbox uh, to post on Instagram. You could send it to a tool called Descript to get it um, transcribed and then you could use the transcription on LinkedIn and on your website uh, with, you know, like embedding the video as well. And all of a sudden with one piece of content, you've got six pieces across, you know, several different platforms that you really didn't have to work too hard to do. So I would say create once and then squeeze all the juice out of it that you can. Fantastic. So morning, Sharon, morning, Jim. Jim Parker, it's taken me 54 years to become an overnight success. So <laughs> Jim has been unbelievable consistent with his social and his, you know, the reason why he's late this morning, he does um, his morning live half seven every morning. And he is consistent, consistent, consistent. And his business is absolutely flying as a result of Jim Parker, that 54 year old Scottish gentleman in five, being there nonstop in everybody's face and fair play to him he's doing brilliantly absolutely brilliantly jim clubhouse is a copy of the old cb radio um morning jane morning sharka morning ashley thanks very much for joining us so tech wise also you spoke you must see loads of different tech and you touched on it there 
Um, you see any exciting, shiny new things? Or actually, to be honest, forget the shiny new things. What actually works? You know, what <laughs> yeah, um, what actually works? Uh, the tech you use is the tech that works. So, you know, like a, a great question on, um, you know, that always comes up on social media in Australia is what CRM is the best one? And, um, you know, and people will give their recommendations, you know, like of, of different CRMs that have worked for them. And, you know, like, and I think it's the CRM that you actually use is the one that works for you. And, you know, if, if uh, and I think the trouble is, is that we all see these shiny objects and we perhaps use, you know, 40 or 50% of the tool that we've already got and, um, you know, probably missing great opportunities. And the other thing with tech is, you know, um, if I put my consumer's hat back on again, uh, over the last couple of months, we've been over teched by real estate agents. Um, and so, you know, like some people we haven't even had a human conversation with, it's all happened via email. And I can tell you this is that if you don't have those human conversations, you don't build a relationship. Like, you know, you can't, you can't physically build a relationship with someone's letterbox. You can't physically build a relationship, um, you know, with someone's inbox. Um, you really need to pick up the phone and start building that relationship. Now we're not we're not big investors or anything like that. We're just standard everyday. Um, you know there must be a lot of us out there. So the thing is, though, it's missing an opportunity. And we just talked about your CRM system. So let's just say you know the person behind the name in your database. There's actually you know 200 of those people. What sort of an opportunity are you missing by not building a relationship and picking up the phone? Because I don't, I don't feel close to anyone, particularly that I've dealt with in the last couple of weeks during our move. And so, you know, like I, I you know, the chances are I wouldn't go back there. I'd probably look for somebody around here. And it was similar when we were selling our office in Sydney. And I know it's a commercial property, but we went through the same thing. Like we, we got to meet this agent up the road. We run, ran into him at the pub every now and then. He wasn't annoying. He would just, you know, sort of drop in and say hi every now and then. He'd come come round to um, our office and say, hey, can I have the latest magazine or something like that? And we just sort of built this um, relationship with him just popping in and not saying, are you going to sell, are you going to sell, are you going to sell? Um, and then when it came time to sell, again, he, you know, we, we interviewed three agents and he was the most expensive of, of, of all three. But again, we sort of felt like he was the one that we had the relationship with. So, you know, relationship with. So, you know, like I, I like tech for it being an enabler and for it being a productivity um, tool. And if you can get more productive by using tech, by all means, go for it. Um, but don't let tech replace the human relationships, which is something that, um, you know, I think is really easy to do when you can sit behind email. But, you know, but I think it's a missed opportunity. Brilliant. What a great, what a great answer. I was going to pick up my phone and say, that's the best tech out there. Speak to people. Have <laughs> and actually what we're doing now, the best tech is having conversations with people, you know, and just finding out. So, you know, today I know that you're a landlord. Uh, or an owner of a property so you know I would try and help you on that and see what your long-term plans are and try and come up with a maintenance plan for you to help you to add value so you can get some capital appreciation um, yeah. and then maybe come to you and say look are you looking to um, add add to your property portfolio and make it into an empire and kingdom that'd be interesting yeah, well, how many acres have... oh, sorry I was going to say my husband would be really into that but I'll, I'll give you a great piece of dialogue, actually. It was from a guy that I interviewed uh, last year. His name is Jim Remley. He's from the US. And um, and you'll hear it on the podcast. He was being a real estate agent with me. And the question that he asked me is, and, and I guess you can ask this uh, for people listening in any situation that you end up in, is say to them, uh, okay, so look, I'm a real estate agent. Can I ask you about your housing situation at the moment? I have to, you know, because I'm because <laughs> I'm a state agent and make a bit of a joke out of it. And so then he he said, this is a great piece of dialogue. And then he said to me, uh, so Sam, what is your housing situation? 
and I felt and and out of me tumbled. Well, we're living in this apartment block that's across the road from this building with a heap of asbestos in it, and we're trying to get to Queensland, and we're <laughs> da, 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 da. and then all of a sudden, um, you know, someone's just absolutely, you know, let loose on uh on on their whole hopes and dreams which was me live on a podcast (laughs) (laughs) um but then you know like so um and then the second question is and what's your dream situation and so you know like all all of a sudden he's just got aspirational with me and so he's taking notes the whole time and he said well now you know what i would do with you is now i know that you want to move to the gold coast and you want the palm trees and things like that and, you know, maybe you can't afford it at the moment, but I might keep in touch with you via email to say, hey, I just saw this. I remember we had that conversation about that. What do you think of this property? Um, and then just generally just, you know, like he knows what my destination is. And so, you know, I just thought that they were two really great pieces of dialogue from someone sitting there with a consumer hat on at the time. And, you know, yeah, basically if you listen to that podcast, you'll hear my whole, <laughs> my whole, and it was just out of two, just two questions. Yeah, no, likewise. And what the one question that I'm finding that works really well, something similar at the moment, is just how's your living space? And yeah. then from, and then, and then, and then from there it's, oh, I hate my partner. I hate my family. The garden's too small. I need more office space. I need more broadband. Okay, great. So if I was to find you your next property within your price range, would you consider moving today? Actually, yes. And what's been really interesting on my training, I've asked that and I've had five people that have bought within the last year that are already ready to move because they've realized through lockdown their property is too small. So it's, um, you know, and it is all about asking questions, you know, and, and opening doors, you know. So, again, can I ask you, you may not want to share, but how big is your property empire? Oh, it's not. It's <laughs> we've got we've got a couple of properties in our self-managed super fund. And at the moment, you know, like we're, um, you know, we're we're renting where we live um, purely because like. I suppose buying a home was just a bit too much of a stretch as we're looking for something that's a renovator. Okay, so just for the first one, because obviously the latest one is a new property, your first um, buy-to-let property, how many years have you owned that one? Sorry, say that again? How many years did you have you owned your first buy-to-let investment? Uh, do you mean our office? No, was it? So have you got a, a residential property that buy-to-lets as well? Yes, yes, we do, but we've only just bought that one. Oh, that's the first one. Okay, fine. Okay, then ignore my next question. Okay. <laughs> we so, needed that. <laughs> that's fine. Okay. But no, that's great. So what other learnings have you had from, um, I mean, Alexander Phillips? In fact, let's go down the trainer route because you've had Josh Vegan, Daniel Spencer, Tom Panos, um, John McGrath, I'm sure, Troy Malcolm, um, and um, there are loads more that um, Mr. Shergold. So you, there's some exceptional, exceptional Lee Woodward, exceptional trainers out there. Um, what do you learn from the best trainers? What have you taken away from them? Oh, lots of things. Actually, I recently did Michael Shergold's Coach the Coach course. Um, and actually, we've got a podcast coming out this week where we were talking about some of my takeaways from Coach the Coach. So I think, you know, and, and I don't know if it's the same in the UK, but a lot of people go into business ownership in um, in Australia having done all right at the sales caper and then they come into leadership a little bit unprepared. And so Michael's Coach the Coach course and there were people all around the world um, in this course and it was really great in terms of, you know, rethinking the employee you know, that you've got to think of your employees as clients as well as you think of your clients as clients and, you know, and how to get them to another stage where, um, you know, where where their fulfilment equals your fulfilment. And, yeah, that was that was like one of the best courses I ever did. A lot of things I learned from that is that, you know, it's really hard to start. So think of trying to get a 747 off the ground. And I would liken that to a career in real estate, you know, like think about the energy and the power and everything if we were still travelling. Um, 
you know, about how hard it is to get a plane to take off. But then once it's in the air um, and cruising, it's actually a lot easier. And I think, you know, you've got to remember that in a real estate career, particularly if you're starting off, it's hard to get the plane off the ground. But once the plane is off the ground and you're in momentum, um, you know, it's, it's a pretty amazing thing. And the other thing is, you know, if you're a leader listening to this, and I remember this clearly, is you can't hold people accountable to their goals um, because, you know, like a goal is, is, is out there and it's great to have goals and all the rest of it, but you can only hold people accountable to actions. So, you know, again, a lot of, a lot of leaders will say, all right, well, this is your goal. Let's, you know, you know off, off you, off your shoot sort of thing. Um, but you can't, in, you can't come back and say, well, why haven't you achieved that goal? when, um, you know, you can't actually hold someone accountable to a goal, but you can sort of say, well, if you want to reach this goal of doing 50 transactions in this this year, then that means you're going to have to make X calls, you're going to have to close X listings, you're going to have to negotiate, you, you know, like work backwards and then you can hold people accountable to various actions because then if you don't get to that goal, then you can say, well, okay, we need some help on this bit, this bit, this bit, this bit. So there were some there were some great things in in that course. I think on the whole, like, you know, if if you're asking me about about coaches, I think there's different coaches for different people at different times, you know. And I think also the subject of coaching is you you should always outgrow your coach, <laughs> um, you know. And so it, at some point you might take on someone like say a Tom Panos if you feel like you really need you know someone to kick up the butt. Um, you might take on someone like Josh Fegan if, you know, you're sort of at, at a point of view where you really want solid systems and work on your energy and things like that. Um, you know, and I think that they're, they're all exceptional coaches, um, albeit in different ways. Claudio Encina, I mean, again, he's probably one of my favourites and we've worked with Claudio a lot over the years and he's got, um, you know, he's doing some really interesting thinking in in. Uh, the area of making people feel safe because I think this pandemic has shown us one thing is that, you know, like let's just say we want to, to buy or sell our house in a pandemic, um, you know, who's coming into my house? Where have they been? Are their hands clean? Um, you know, how long is it going to take to sell? Um, who, you know, like all of these things are going through the consumer's mind, you know, and the consumer wants to feel safe. And, you know, like in Claudio's done some excellent thinking around, you know, um, too much noise, too much audio, let's get rid of that, let's get out the pen and the paper and I'm going to show you like a nine-step plan um, that's going to get your house sold while keeping you and your family safe. Yeah, that's definitely the message that you've got to be giving out there. Um, yeah. Great advice, thank you. So just final question um what about yourself what do you do what what's your reading habits have you got any business books that you highly recommend for the people that are listening or um watching today yes i uh i'm a big fan of james clear um atomic habits i think is probably like the bible and i think i've read that three times because we are the sum of our habits and well, that's, that's one side of it. But I also think something that James Clear says is that success is equal parts action and reflection. And so, um, you know, a lot of a lot of times in the real estate industry, we're, t we're told to do more. Like if something's not working for you, do more, just add more calls or send more emails or, you know, get more listings or, you know, just it's just more. But what if you keep adding more, but you don't reflect back on what truly worked for you? And, um, you know, and I think that reflection part is something that we don't take enough time to do is to go back and go, all right, well, what really did work for me? Um, you know, if if you're not converting appointments on the phone, what are you saying? Like, you know, can, can you reflect back on that and try and change the conversation a bit before you add more? Because the result is if you add more to something that's not working, you just get more of what doesn't work rather than, you know, like being able to tweak and you know I'm known for saying everything's a test till it's not so James Clear would be one the other guy I think is pretty interesting at the moment is a guy called um Dave Asprey you know the the bulletproof guy I think um he's got some really interesting thinking um not just you know eat a bulletproof 
sorry, eat a bullet, bulletproof coffee, drink a bulletproof coffee. Um, but, you know, like there's a lot of stuff that, you know, he's sort of written about in his book Game Changes about productivity, which really interests me, you know, the stuff on routine and, um, you know, minimising your decisions of a morning and, and you know, and things like that. Like I think um, they were the last two books I read um, and highly recommend both. Okay, um, I read an exceptional book by or audio BJ Fogg, um, which is Tiny Habits. Um, I'll send you the link. That that's made a massive, massive difference to my productivity. Um, yeah. Very much on the James Clear lines, but was it absolutely exceptional? Um, and I came across him through a guy called Jim Quick. I don't know if you come across Quick Brain. Um, great, um, small bite size um, podcast, but well, they make a massive, massive difference. Actually, you've just reminded me of another book that I, I did consume really quickly over summer, and I would recommend it. Um, it's uh, Shonda Rhimes' The Year of Yes. Um, so basically the premise of this book, Shonda Rhimes is the, the, the lady that writes Grey's Anatomy and how to, um, how to Get Away with Murder and Scandal, one of my favourite shows. And more recently, um, you know, everyone's a fan of Bridgerton on Netflix. She actually wrote that show too. Um, you know, rewind a couple of years and uh, she used to get invited to all these great places, but her sister said, well, what's the point? You know, like you've just been invited to something by Barack Obama, by Barack Obama, uh, you're not going to go anyway, so why are you even talking about it? And, you know, she sort of took a moment and said, well, you know, why is that? And she said, because you just say no to everything. And uh, so she challenged herself one, one year to say yes to every invitation um, and to say yes to things like happiness and gratitude and, and stuff like that. And, I, you know, it's, it's a really easy read and I was intrigued because, um, you know, I saw them advertising it on an app called Peloton, which you guys might be familiar with in the UK. I think I'm their, their only Aussie member, but um, they're doing this Year of Yes special, which made me, um, you know, go and look at the book. And, and now, you know, like I've lately been thinking, well, what am I saying yes to? Um, or can I say yes? To things that I normally would say no to and I think it really does that changes your disposition into well you know what's the worst thing that could happen I'll try this you know and so already this year I've tried more than probably I would have last year fantastic well look I'm incredibly grateful that you said yes to coming on this morning and being on this podcast so thank you very much I'm incredibly grateful thank you all for watching and listening um have a really good Monday just to let you know tomorrow at seven o'clock in the evening I've got Mark Hunter who will be talking all things sales from America on Thursday I've got at half past 12 Andy Neal who um, is a UK agent who went to the States for a couple of years so we're going to be discussing his experience of both of those uh, I just want to give a massive thank you to everybody who's donated for the laptops for homeschooling um, campaign that I'm organizing. £38,000 has been donated, which is absolutely incredible so far. Got loads and loads more to go. 85 laptops have gone up to schools and more is going to go out today. So please, please, please um, have conversations with your suppliers. Put a little bit of pressure on them um, to um, join in as well. Um, so we can help more kids um, get an education in lockdown and um, have an amazing week. So thanks all for joining. Look forward to seeing you or uh, tomorrow night. Um, Sam, thank you for being the most thanks, incredible Sam. guest and giving me and everybody your time um, this evening or this morning. Thanks a lot. Bye, thank you for having me, guys. You're welcome.